Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I have an announcement. Douglas Barr, your cell phone is at registration if you're in this room. Douglas Barr, you have a cell phone at registration. Well, I want to welcome everybody to this session. I'm Mike Jungbauer. I'm your moderator this morning. I'm a state senator from Minnesota. I got involved in the climate change debate about seven years ago. And I'm just excited to be here and learn so many things. I was here at last year's um, first international conference. And uh, we'll get right into the speakers. We've changed the order a little bit. Um, our speaker, Valentine, has just arrived, so he will be last. Our first speaker, William Kinnamonth. Um, is a consulting climatologist with the Australian Climate Research Institute. He has worked with the Australian Bureau of Meteorology for 38 years in weather forecasting, research, and applied studies. For 12 years, he was head of the National Climate Center. I'm going to make my introductions very short because as all, we all know we want to get right into the meat of what's going on here and give the speakers as much time as possible. So give, let's give a hand for William Kinnamon. Thank you, Mike, for the introduction. And uh, what I want to talk about this morning is a natural limit to anthropogenic global warming. We hear a lot about dangerous climate change, dangerous global warming, tipping points, and uh, even the potential for runaway global warming. What I want to demonstrate this morning is none of that is on, that there is natural limits to global warming. And I guess in, in putting this uh, presentation together, I must give recognition to C.H.B. Priestley, who wrote a paper back in 1966 called The Limitations of, the Limitation of Temperature by Evaporation in Hot Climates. And he pointed out to the very basic point that uh, if you've got a, uh, a wet land surface, vegetation, you have a lot of evaporation and that has a cooling effect. And so he did a very nice study pointing out that uh, there is in fact uh, a big difference between the, uh, the temperature that you can attain, whether or not you have a wet surface or a, uh, a, uh, an arid or semi-arid surface. And recognising that the Earth is sort of 70% ocean and a lot more of it is actually transpiring vegetation, we must take a account of the fact of what uh, he pointed out back in 1966. But first of all, what I want to go through is just three of the assumptions of the anthropogenic global warming hypothesis. The first is that prior to industrialization, there was global average radiation balance at the top of the atmosphere. Now that's an assumption. We have no measurements for what was happening prior to, to, to industrialization. In fact, we can't even measure at the present time whether there's uh, radiation balance at the top of the atmosphere. Uh, Trenberth and colleagues have done a number of papers over the last two decades based on satellite measurements and so forth, pointing out that uh, you can't really, to within about three or four watts per square metre, get a, uh, a balance out of the, the actual data. So that is an assumption. The second is that radiation forcing by anthropogenic greenhouse gases is the global average reduction in upward-directed infrared radiation at the tropopause. Now, we'll have a look in a, a few minutes about the change in radiation uh, to space, but they say, not to space, but at the tropopause. Now, the tropopause is something which anywhere varies from day to day through the seasons. It's, it's not a, uh, a, uh, a level in the atmosphere that, is, that one can actually define with any confidence. So if one talks about the change in, in uh, infrared radiation at the tropopause, it's something which is very difficult to, to measure. And thirdly, they say there is a direct relationship between the radiation forcing, that's the change in the radiation at the tropopause, and surface temperature increase by a factor of delta Ts. And so they have this little uh, equation there where lambda is the sensitivity factor. Now, there's no theory linking the change in, in uh, radiation at the tropopause with the surface temperature. It's an assumption, and uh, the only way that lambda is actually evaluated is through computer models and the IPCC says that uh, lambda is consistent with all computer models but it differs between computer models. So it's here we have another assumption which is something which is cannot be actually quantified, can't be 
uh, got from first principles, it is an assumption of the hypothesis. Let's have a look at a little bit about the radiation. We'll just, uh, see, it's a seemingly plausible but not verifiable assumptions that, that go into the hypothesis. The anthropogenic uh, emissions of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, they, they do change the infrared radiation. They change the infrared radiation to space in the CO2 band. In other words, they reduce the CO2 to space. They also increase the infrared radiation back at the surface. So when they talk about the, the change at the tropopause, that's only half of the, the discussion. We'll come to that, the second part, the surface, in a little while. But if we look at the, uh, do some calculations, and what I've done here is calculated the, the change in infrared radiation up to space, uh, and also the change at the surface at different CO2 concentrations. And you'll see across the, uh, the bottom there that the concentration is doubling with each category, 0, 50, 100, 200, 400, 800. And so we see the IR loss to space after 50 parts per million essentially a linear trend, the same incremental decrease with each doubling. But similarly, the back radiation at the surface is increasing because, again, the radiation is from a lower, warmer level in the atmosphere. What I've done here is calculate these using the US standard atmosphere just for, for uh, indicative purposes. But what we see, the net atmospheric IR loss actually doesn't change or changes very little. So that one has to look at a uh, much more uh, complex way in terms of, of how does this radiation interact with the, uh, the Earth's climate. Let's now look at the, um, how it may in fact force climate by changing IR at the top of the atmosphere, this, this first assumption. Here we have from Trenberth and Caron in uh, 2001 the, the, lo the uh, net uh, radiation at the top of the atmosphere had changes from, from the pole to the equator to the poles. What we see is that there is no local radiation balance anywhere at the top of the atmosphere. In the equatorial region, we get excess solar radiation coming in. In the polar regions, we get excess uh, long-wave radiation going to space. The only way that you can get a balance is by having a lot of transport of energy from the tropics to the pole. And so one of the things that becomes very uh, clear is that the surface temperature is not so much a matter of the local radiation, but it's also the transport of energy by the oceans and the atmosphere. This uh, same paper by Trenberth and Caron, they point out that about 80% of the transport from the tropics to the poles is actually by the atmosphere and the other 20% by the oceans. It's not very difficult to understand that if that uh, breakup, that categorization shifted from 81, 82% to the atmosphere to say 18% uh, uh, to, uh, to the oceans, we would have a different transport, we would have different temperatures in the, uh, in the polar regions because the polar temperatures are maintained largely by the transport of, of heat from the tropics. If you reduce the transport of heat from the tropics, you'll have a much colder polar region. And we see this in the uh, El Nino, La Nina episodes, that during a La Nina, we tend to have uh, cooler temperatures, particularly in wintertime, in the middle and high latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere. And in El Nino times, more heat is transported poleward, and so we have warmer temperatures. So it's not just a radiation balance, radiation problem that we're dealing with. Secondly, the climatology of radiation to space shows that the radiation is dominated, particularly in, the, in the, uh, the tropics and subtropics, it's dominated by cloud and moisture distribution. We see here the uh, sort of the yellowy lines in the uh, equatorial region over Indonesia, the Indian Ocean, the Western Pacific, and also the, uh, the Congo Basin, the Amazon Basin. These are the high clouds, uh, very low reduction, uh, uh, radiation to space. The very blue, the very high radiation to space, which is the dry area, the subsiding air, the, that pattern changes from the season, it changes from year to year. So it's not driven by carbon dioxide or anything, it's the, the circulation of the, of the atmosphere and the ocean 
which is dominating that. It's the temperature driving the radiation to space. So to talk about reducing radiation to space in the very small carbon dioxide bands that's going to change the whole climate and temperature of the Earth is like so the, the, dog, the tail wagging the dog. It's the, it's the dog, it's, it's the, the climate system which determines where the radiation to space goes and by how. Carbon dioxide increases surface back radiation. We get to this point of the, the radiation which is ignored by the IPCC. If the, uh, we increase the carbon dioxide, we increase the surface back radiation, we increase the surface temperature. And by increasing the surface temperature, we increase the surface radiation. And at the same time, because so much of the Earth is covered by ocean, the latent energy increases. And this is essentially the, the sort of the situation that, that Priestley pointed to in terms of, he was talking in terms of agriculture and over the land, but he also mentioned as a, uh, as a byword that, uh, of course, the warmest temperatures over the ocean are only about 30 degrees centigrade. And it's because of the, the balance that, that is, uh, is reached there. If you change any of those components, particularly if you change the carbon dioxide, you change the emission, you change the latent energy. And also we must uh, recognise that uh, by changing the surface temperature, we also change the temperature of the atmosphere in the layer above. And this is the feedback process. It also holds more moisture, you get more back radiation. So the, the blue line over on the, the far right, there's a CO2 component there, but there's also a feedback process once you've raised the, the temperature. The back radiation uh, forcing, the what's called delta F by CO2, causes a surface temperature response, delta Ts. And this is, can be given by the equation which brings those four terms together. The, the left-hand term is the forcing by carbon dioxide. Right over on the right is the surface temperature increase by that forcing. And that's brought about by the rate of change of the increase of uh, infrared radiation emission, the increase of latent heat exchange, and decreased by the feedback of the increased back radiation from the atmosphere. So it's not actually a very complex equation. It's essentially saying conservation of energy. Conservation of energy at the surface. We can manipulate that, that equation. Uh, Recognising that the first two terms on the right-hand side are the energy loss from the surface, if we divide the right through by that, we get a, a, uh, an equation which comes like so. Three terms, the surface temperature rise, the unforced surface temperature rise by carbon dioxide, and the feedback. The first term, the unforced carbon dioxide, is the the forcing by uh, infrared radiation by carbon dioxide divided by the rate of increase of surface energy loss. The feedback term, 1 minus R, is the ratio, the R is the ratio of the, of the feedback radiation to the surface energy loss. The point to, there's two points to make there. One is that the, the rate of increase of surface energy loss with temperature, that constrains the direct temperature increase in the first term, it also affects the uh, feedback term, the R. And if you just look at that, uh, that feedback term, if R approaches 1, that whole amplification gets very large. If R is small, the amplification also is very small. The fact that we've got latent energy in the denominator is one of the factors that keeps that uh, feedback term small. It also tends to reduce the rate of increase of temperature by the direct forcing. So we've got a, a, uh, an equation that we can do there, but if we look at the, how those different uh, rates of change uh, change over the temperature range that we might see on Earth. First is the surface uh, infrared emission, how that changes, and the back radiation at the surface, how that also changes. Both increase at about the same rate. The, uh, the surface temperature, the surface emission increases according to the uh, Stefan Boltzmann law, the fourth power of temperature. 
and the back radiation is much the same because the temperature above the surface is not much different from the, from the surface. But of course we've got a lower emissiv emissivity, but the emissivity is increasing as we get more, more uh, moisture in the atmosphere. So essentially those two terms are increasing at about the same rate. So the net loss from the surface from radiation doesn't change very much. But we see that the surface energy exchange, uh, which uh, increases according to the clouds displaporin relationship, about 7% for every degree centigrade, it does increase continuously. So we put those two bottom together, which is actually the, the response of the surface, we find that the, the surface temperature is very stable for a particular temperature. The uh, surface temperature across the bottom between 10 and 15, the energy exchange on the, uh, the axis, the surface energy loss, the net surface energy loss increases quite rapidly with temperature. We've scaled it so that at 15 degrees, the global temperature of the Earth, uh, the solar and, and others uh, match there. And what we find that if we, for example, um, drop the temperature of the, of the Earth's surface by a degree, we find that the input, the solar radiation, is about six watts per square metre more than what the surface loss is. And so the surface will warm up. In the same way, if the surface temperature gets a little bit uh, above the equilibrium, the steady state, it's losing more energy than what it's receiving, it will slip back. And so we find a fairly stable temperature. What happens though if we put in carbon dioxide, we force it? All we do is we shift the surface, net surface energy loss slightly, so that at 15 degrees it comes down around about four watts per square metre, which is the, the forcing from a doubling of CO2. The surface is now not emitting, not losing as much energy as it was, and so it comes to a, a another steady state about 0.6 of a degree warmer than it, what uh, it started off. And so one might expect a warming. Now, we're using here the clausius clapeyron relationship. There's two papers now which quite uh, conven oh, point out that the models used in the fourth assessment report severely underestimated the rate of increase of evaporation with temperature. Held in Soden in 2006, and um, uh, Wentz and colleagues in science in 2007. Uh, Heldon Soden said it's about a third of the clausius clapeyron relationship, and uh, Wentz say it's between 1% and 3% and, uh, as against 6%. And they actually measured by the satellites that it was in fact around about 6%. So if we change that, what we find is that uh, because the computer models underestimate, that that energy loss the, the slope is much less than what it was with a 6% uh, uh, latent energy increase. And so if we have a, a CO2 forcing, we actually uh, increase the temperature to a new steady state by more than 0.6, up to about 1.5. If we get to the lower value, which um, uh, Wentz and colleagues found in some of the models, we might get out to about 3 and 4. So we're now getting to this stage of what the computer models are being reported by IPCC as against what we might expect under the, uh, the surface energy budget. So the computer models exaggerate the surface temperature increase with anthropogenic uh, emissions of CO2. If we just go back to the equations, and we can quite uh, readily get some of those, those values at uh, about 15 degrees, the average temperature of the Earth, to get uh, an indicative uh, change. So the Stefan Boltzmann gives the uh, DFUDT as 5.4. The uh, from Modtrans, any of the other any of the uh, radiation transfer models, we can get the change in downward radiation with increasing temperature and, and humidity. And we just put in the different values of latent heat exchange. Six percent is what Wentz found from satellites. Is what uh, Earth uh, actually uh, was the observation over the last couple of decades of satellites. Uh, 2% is the average of the uh, computer models as found by Held and Soden and as low as 1% according to, uh, to Wentz. And so we find that what we'd anticipate, 0.6 of a degree from, uh, from theory and the, and the observations that we have and, and conservation of energy, in the models which are internally consistent, they are in fact uh, shifting some of that energy loss from evaporation to uh, uh, radiation exchange and so it must be at a higher temperature. 
And so we, we have a, an understanding of why it is that computer models give these much higher values than what we do if we looked at the, uh, the physics of the situation. So what I'm saying in summary is that CO2 affects the global temperature through its increase in back radiation at the surface. Age, uh, anthropogenic global warming is real. Water vapour amplifies the CO2 forcing by a factor of two. This is the back radiation. But the increased rate of latent energy exchange with temperature, it constrains the surface temperature response from the doubling of CO2 forcing to about 0 0.6 degree. Remembering that Earth is the water planet. 70% is ocean and a large fraction of the remainder is transpiring vegetation. The GCMs used in the IPCC fourth assessment report, they significantly underestimate the rate of increase in latent energy exchange with temperature. They don't change the, or don't underestimate the actual latent energy exchange, it's the rate of increase of latent energy exchange. And so what they're doing is that uh, they are in fact exaggerating the temperature rise. So AGW is in fact real. I would estimate about, indicatively, about 0.6 of a degree. It's certainly less than the two degree which uh, is being put forward as, as dangerous. And certainly it's not in a runaway situation because as long as we've got a water planet, we've got this latent energy which is constraining temperature rise. Thank you very much. <laughs>